Hello, I'm Ruthie Doyle. I run the New Frontier Lab programs and I'm here with Devin, Jeremy, Corday, and Kite from uh, New Frontier Story Lab 2020 Projects, Earthworks, and Seeing is Believing. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Corday Jatapa Henry. I'm collaborating with Jeremy on Earthworks. Um, my background is in film, uh, animation, uh, and performance, and uh, also in architecture and landscape architecture. Um, and I don't know if Jeremy, you want to introduce yourself as well. Hey, Jeremy Kamal, um, full name Jeremy Hart, Hartley, but I go by Jeremy Kamal, Kamal as an artist, um, visual artist, filmmaker, working in collaboration with Corday on Earthworks. Um, my background is also landscape architecture, architecture, as well as motion um, graphics. And I don't know, Corday, you want to start with the story? Yeah, Earthworks uh, is really a live performance and film. It's uh, basically folding two narratives, exploring uh, this previous project entitled Earth Mother's Godfather, which is a future ritual that takes place in the year 2030. Uh, through live performance, uh, using motion capture technology and uh, virtual production, we can begin to reimagine how um, Black culture kind of envisions the future. Uh, we've been exploring specifically mining technology, mining and technology, uh, but also diving into other aspects of Black culture, uh, meaning sports and ceremony, and how uh, mythology is all embedded within these type of two ideas. Devin and Kite, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourselves and about um, seeing us believing? Hi, uh, my name is Devin Ronneberg. Um, I am an Okinawan native Hawaiian artist and uh, engineer. Um, my work covers a lot of things. Um, uh, I build airplanes, I make music, uh, I'm working in moving image and still image now too, uh, and I do a lot of work in sculpture and installation as well. I'm collaborating with Kite on our project Seeing is Believing, and um, I'll let her introduce herself before we talk about the project. Hi, uh, I'm Kite, or Suzanne Kite. Um, I'm an Oglala Lakota performance artist, visual artist, and composer. And uh, we are in uh, Los Angeles, Tongva land. And uh, I am a PhD candidate at Concordia University, um, research assistant for the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. And uh, generally, I work a lot with computational media and exploring, researching the applications of Lakota ontology to creating ethical protocols with artificial intelligence. And uh, our project, Seen is Believing, uh, is an examination of the intersections between international indigenous communities and extracted materials uh, and the colonial nuclear obsession. And so we are investigating the conflations of belief in fact and conspiracy with hard evidence in this film. And so this project embraces technologies which make fiction seem as real as fact. Um, so technologies such as deep faking and machine learning and text generation from AI. Yeah. We're using a bunch of different softwares in order to make all this possible. Um, we'll be working, like she said, with uh, AI empowered algorithms uh, for deep faking, which is like transposing identities between people, uh, taking people's faces, learning new models, and then applying them to other people. Um, and so we're at a point where um, our technology is becoming cheap and powerful enough that pretty much anybody can start to fabricate uh, false realities that seem as real as the reality we're in. And um, I see this as having really wide ranging implications for our ability to discern what is true and what is false and how we inform our beliefs moving forward. Um, as we've already seen with fake news and a bunch of other things, I just recently heard about governments that are accusing the other party of generating deep fakes because their leaders are dead. All sorts of crazy things are happening um, because of these technologies. So we thought it was important to explore them now as they're being developed and before they become super prevalent. And I'm curious for both teams, you know, what was the spark that what was the genesis of this project? And why, why are why are you telling the story now? And why are you the right person to tell the story now? One of the um, things that I was exploring prior uh, to us, to me and Corday kind of combining on a project together was the relationships between black culture and landscapes and seeing there was a kind of absence in 
the voice of black culture when it pertains to landscapes due to its you know colonial history and so forth and i feel like um it's important to have these discussion now as we in our time as we start to see like how much symbol symbolism is um not speaking for everybody um the kind of dismantling of statues and so forth but even the way our trees are planted and our parks are formed are also symbols of a colonial history that i think um, need to be reconsidered i guess and as we think about earthworks and technologies are also colonial in a lot of way and our technologies today have a very colonial like air to them that we don't really um consider you know uh, I, I feel like on a regular basis we kind of take it for granted and enter these technologies and depend on them so looking at how black culture is interfacing with technologies through earthworks is i think a very important um aspect when I'm thinking about the future um, of technology as well as black culture. I, I definitely feel like it's timely. Um, and Corre, I don't know if you have anything else. Yeah, I mean, to, to second Jeremy, Jeremy's thought, it's like the, the work itself is trying to decolonize knowledge production, right? The way we consume knowledge and information and through the black body as a vessel for that, we can begin to engage that idea and reimagine it at the same exact time. Um, I think Jeremy and I had this notion that the, the black body had to basically inhabit all of its culture as it was transported from Africa to the US, right? It couldn't take artifacts with it. Um, so it had to embody all the culture within it. Uh, so it's very important for us to use the body uh, in relationship to technology to, uh, to again, reimagine its future. I'm really curious if you could talk about, cause I, I don't know how much you got into the platform that you're working with but in thinking about the body with technology, I think you're really approaching it in a really interesting way. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so uh, through, through game engines and through motion capture, uh, motion capture is basically a suit that's linked to a virtual environment and allows individuals, uh, specifically for us through dance, to control things that they normally couldn't, couldn't control, right? Um, so on the screen, what you might see is a, a, a person dancing in, in, a, in a real environment, but on the screen you'll see uh, them controlling a, a god of rare earth that essentially we've created through CGI and through game environments. So, so the role of dance and performance play a large role into storytelling and how we kind of envision uh, this, this world building that we're creating. Yeah, and I think that the technology lets us almost talk to this meta narrative because we're speaking about this relationship of technology and the body and using technology in the body to speak about it. And in the same way that the technology and the body are engaging a whole new discussion in our physical space, the installation, we're also having that kind of conceptual narrative replay itself within that world that you're observing on the screen. And we just feel like it was a very poetic, you know, device or technology to use to talk about the topics we're actually engaging. Absolutely. So literally having the, the digital world and the physical world overlap um, in a really seamless way. Um, Devin and Kate, do you want to tell us a little bit about Seeing is Believing and, you know, uh, what was the spark for this, this project and, and why, why this project now and why are you telling this story? Uh, sure. As I was uh, saying before, uh, we're just kind of reaching the point where these things are possible, where, where computers are good enough to recontextualize our bodies in these new ways. It's, it's similar to what Jeremy and Cordaire are talking about. But with the deepfake stuff, um, it's kind of the opposite because you're taking other people's movements, other people's identities, and kind of, you can you know, uh, manipulate them to your own ends, let's say. So um, yeah, we're, we're kind of watching technology re recontextualize our relationship to our own beliefs in real time. Like as things progress, we kind of have to take more action to um, discern for ourselves what is true, what is false, um, because there's more and more bias in the news, as we all know, but then the ability to take that to the next step and create information that looks real but is completely false is getting easier all the time. Um, Popular examples are kind of hard to come by because it's still a pretty like small niche community that's basically generating like meme content or like, you know, shallow entertainment content or it's being used for really malicious purposes like pornography and other things that are totally morally apprehensible. So, or reprehensible I should say. Um, so 
right now, as I'm saying, it's like this emerging thing where people are learning that it's possible and just seeing what it's what it's good for or what it can be used for. Um, and that's different to pretty much everybody that comes in contact with it. But because it's so powerful, I really do feel like it's going to have a lasting effect on the way that we form our beliefs. Like if you can no longer trust the images in front of you to be true, um, how do you trust anything, right? It requires more research, more contextualization, and more effort on behalf of the individual to find out what is true. And um, that's going to be different for everyone, which is scary, but I think that's just the direction things are moving. So our project is really on, on one level trying to like bring these things to light and give people an opportunity to um, start to take that effort themselves without having to be prompted in some other way or being victim to it, you know, and, uh, and empower people to like, uh, you know, form their beliefs from a solid foundation. Yeah, I think that one of the, the real sparks at the beginning of our project, Seen as Believing, was uh, reading an essay by Luke Cornum, uh, which is called Irradiated International, which uh, was really big inspiration because it tied together the uh, worldwide colonial uranium mining that connects communities that mined uh, these materials and then uh, communities that were bombed with these materials. And I think Devin and I both have personal connections to the use of uranium on um, indigenous peoples. And um, I was thinking a lot about how in uh, South Dakota, they're beginning to reopen uranium mines, even though the water is already irradiated and causes really high rates of cancer. Um, and when we thought about that all together, we could see a real similarity in the, uh, interna in the international um, mining of materials that are, build our computers and the uh, abuse and oppression of um, the peoples who mine those and a similar uh, use of it's, these technologies are so powerful, but they come from real places and they're, they're mined by real people. And, um, and I think we started to make these connections and uh, it was, it was very, uh, it seemed very necessary to tell for us to tell that story now. And, um, and I think this, and there's a lot of other thoughts that we had at the beginning um, that sparked this, such as I was doing research with the um, indigenous protocols and artificial intelligence group. And we, um, we thought we thought a lot about like a positive vision of ethics where we were like this is this is what we should do or this is this is how we should make ethical decisions but when dev and i were exploring this deep faking stuff and he started to produce really interesting deep fakes um it seemed like logical and ne necessary to try to talk about the same issue but from the opposite ethics standpoint to say like okay well, what if we do what if we use bad tools to do bad things but to tell a and to try to say something ethical um with unethical tools which is a big which is a challenge and it has been um it's very rewarding to to switch perspectives like that um so that's like the spark beginning of this work yeah i mean that's something we think about a lot is we've got these mediums emerging mediums that are so powerful in the way that they're going to be affecting our lives or already can affect our bodies or in the case of uranium, you know, not as new of a technology maybe, but you know, it's a technology that affects our lives in such massive ways. And who are the people that have, um, have, a, have a voice in how they're used, um, have a voice in how they're developed. You know, we've got 500 years of mass media with the printing press and we have a pretty terrible historical track record on uh, uh, having a homogenous uh, group of voices being told through those mediums, and even, you know, film, which is a hundred something years and moving image. So that's, that's a great point. We've got these um, incredibly powerful technologies that are bridging these gaps and affecting our bodies. Um, they also yeah. have the potential to be weaponized, which is, is another big thing. Like nuclear technology, super powerful technology that has many uses that are arguably great, you know, really efficient at making power. But they can also be taken and adopted into these really destructive and exploitative things, uh, violent things, you know. And I just, uh, we, we see that this colonial ideology that is reliant upon ownership in order to extract from, you know, uh, as being the thing that enables these uh, really powerful and sometimes wonderful advances in technology to be used against the people that they should be helping. 
and uh, the same thing that happened with nuclear technology is probably going to happen with artificial intelligence uh, as we're already seeing it being used to understand us better so that other people can profit from that understanding. It's kind of a long chain and it's one that we're constantly trying to contextualize, but we see that that there's a direct link between the extraction of these materials, either uranium or rare earth metals for computational devices or what have you, all the way to the top of the people that are running, you know, or that, that have the most power because of the, the amount of wealth that they control. And so these extractive methodologies aren't only used for, for materials, but they're used for labor, for people, uh, what have you. So. Um, yeah, just, to me, it seems like human human greed, like our biggest shortcoming, is directly responsible for a lot of the atrocities that are happening in the world, um, that and many of which are preventable. And so, there is some level of implication that we're trying to to convey here, where we we think that the people that are responsible for creating these technologies should be responsible for their outcomes, and maybe if they were, the outcomes would be a little bit better for more people. I mean, capitalism is the short version, right? The short answer, <laughs> one word. Right. Um, that's, that's the easy one. And I think, yeah, exactly. I think that's exactly why it's important to have these variety of voices for people who aren't purely uh, out for profit. You know, you guys are interested in what technologies can do that aren't profit motive, uh, motivated. Yeah. Um, or at least profit Louise, motivated feel- for more people. Right, or at least more equitably um, motivated. I think it, a lot of the work is about reclaiming, um, reclaiming our own role in, in society in terms of how we engage with technology. Um, a lot of the project started with uh, uh, investigating what's happening in the Congo with uh, excavating rare earth minerals and how that's um, basically a supply chain all the way to even the game engines that we use to play, you know, PlayStation and Xbox, you know. So there's a there's a direct direct correlation to um, our own uh, entertainment, to the ability to 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 um, create these environments where individuals are sacrificing their lives for the rare earth minerals. So that is the tension, like that is the tension that we're finding, you know, uh, you know, technology in, in the places that we don't we won't normally imagine technology to be, right? Um, This is the foundation of it. This is where it comes from. So how do we uh, basically bridge that and connect those lines through culture, through ideas of um, of performance, through music? You know, all of these ideas are already embedded within Black culture. So how do we use that as a vehicle um, to also talk about this this topic as well? Yeah, and I think you, I think it's, I think you said it quite, elegantly but also we we had a discussion with um amelia earlier and she said um the colonial mindset is i see it i want it i like it i take it and if that's at the heart of an an ethos and that ethos is the same ethos that creates a technology that builds a landscape that you know owns property that heart is still speaking and it's what we're seeing today in terms of um racism it's just this you just assume <laughs> that racism is somewhat embedded in all of these uh, factors and just assume that that ethos of I see it, I want it, I like it, I take it is embedded. And I think what we're doing in our work is juxtaposing different cultural um, values and premises. That's a cultural premises, like that premise um, that created the superstructure, super cultural structure of colonialism. I see it, I want it, I take it, I like it. Capitalism evolves, colonialism evolves from that. And we're trying to figure out what when, when different premises are juxtaposed to these very high powered technologies that are used for that premise, what can come, come about? Um, the technologies of excavation, um, mineral extraction, what happens when that's paired with ritual dance and the summoning of a deity? Um, and are there new results? And it's not a matter of, I, we know the answer, and we know what's gonna fix what or what's, how things are gonna work, but what happens when there's a different cultural motivation that's juxtaposed next to these kind of commonly known colonial processes. And are there new results that come about? Um, Yeah, so when excavation becomes a ritual dance, um, what are the new forms that come about? What are the new cultural relationships and the cultural ecologies that then form from this premise? And I think that brings up a good point that I think all four of you have something really interesting to say about, you know, how can we use these new technologies, how can we use these stories, your projects 
for healing, for justice, for celebration. And it's easy kind of to talk about um, and important to talk about the ways that they can be used unethically. But I think, Kite, you kind of hinted at this, Jeremy and, and Corday, you hinted at this too in this conversation. Um, you know, what are some ways that you can imagine um, your work, these technologies, your projects, your ideas working in that direction? Yeah, I think that's actually what is so powerful to me about the Earthworks project is that it's like the thinking in future, like uh, thinking about the future and imagine actively imagining the future is probably the most powerful tool because unless you imagine the future and make a plan for it, then how are you going to execute, how are you going to execute um, change, you know? And so I think that's, that's what really strikes me about that pro about you guys project, because, you know, one of the things that I learned so much about um, through like asking myself, well, what, 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 what is the difference between Lakota world and Western world? Like what makes it different and what makes, what, what's the reason that, you know, we treat stones the way we do when other people don't see them, see it as take it, do whatever I want with it, you know? Um, and I think, and what came to me, what, what the, what, I realized in the research was that it was because we see stones as as beings, as animate beings, as like transformable, sacred, and and once you start with that little kernel of logic, just like you're saying, Jeremy, like the once you take that kernel of logic and explode it into build a whole world, maybe a whole future world, then it's it's a different world. Like you're not, you would never make dis, these mining decisions if you if you have a, re a real relationship with the stone. So that's what's powerful about imagining new, um, imagining new futures. And, and that's not necessarily what, exactly what Devin and I are doing here, but maybe some version of that. But I think that's kind of, to me, at the core of any good future indigenous, like non, trying to not move away from Western ontologies, like that kind of work is when it says like, you take a kernel of, of ethical goodness and you explode it onto a whole imagined world build it built world okay thanks um and can I, just to to you guys's project and what's awesome about it is um and, and this is going to be just like an accolade sessions but you know it's just i think what what you you guys are doing with your work is you're, you're you're really being honest about what the technology is and it's it's uses in how you guys are engaging with how do we turn use something that's commonly used for bad purposes to do something else uh, essentially and i think that's a premise that is a very honest and productive premise especially in our time where i look at the you know our administration now presidentially and one one way it's like horrible but in another way it's like it's, it's necessary like these things we're actually going to have to engage in these pre-existing conditions that weren't ne necessarily so hot and see what a different possibility is. And I think that's a very realistic and grounded way of um, just imagining in general, right? I think, I still think it's another process of imagining, but from a different space. And in general, um, the idea of fictions is we're all engaging in the kind of these fictions. Um, Birth of a Nation to me, uh, that film that kind of spearheaded a lot of the jargon and of racism that we see today is a fiction and it's commonly seen as a war drama but i think that undermines exactly what what's actually happening to me and my, from my opinion it's actually a fiction that's propagating a way of looking at the world and actually changing the minds of people in in reality and i think there's a power that fiction has innately um for everybody who who receives it i think the cyber truck that we see today is a product of you know blade runner fiction and that's a real world truck that will occupy our streets in the real world so fictions are constantly shaping um the way we actually operate in the world somebody with a billion dollars who is inspired by a movie may make a truck that we find as a new norm for ourselves that came from something that some guy decades ago um <laughs> thought of in his head so i think um fictions are just in general we're all in this process of fictions and, and it's super powerful and like i said to you guys this project the idea of taking what we have and not not calling it anything but what it is and understanding what other possibilities are um allowed for from that i think is super productive and powerful 
Yeah, and I, I think the, the power is in the title, right? Seeing is believing. I think that's it in, it, in itself. Like, you know, the, the more we see something, the more we believe it, and the more it becomes actually real, right? And I think that is the, that is a powerful note that you all are engaging with, like, um, and just pivoting the conversation, I think is so important too. Like, I think you find a new landing point for the project once you pivot the conversation away from how this is being used for terror or from, for, from exploitation, but you pivot the conversation with like, how can we actually use this to benefit um, or to add value uh, to our society? I think that's where the, the fruit um, and the juices are for your project. Right, like we are where we are, right? Like we're here, all these things have been made. It's like, what are we gonna do? Try to erase and start over from square one? No, we should be recontextualizing. We should take all these things that we can now learn because of our connections to each other, uh, even in this crazy time, right? Like we're here. Uh, we can share all of our knowledge and, and use that to reformat the things that we already do and already know and already live with. So um, yeah, it's, it's really cool how you guys are doing it and we're trying to do the same thing. Like, so it's just cool that we share that. And do you guys want to add anything else um, before I switch topics? I want to make sure that you feel like we've really covered everything you feel like you had to say about anything that we've just talked about or any of the questions that related to this that, that you maybe prepared something. I just want to make sure that you have a chance before I change topic. Um, I just wanted to add to that um, conversation that I think that it is the, the I think the gap that I see in AI ethics research is the inclusion of black voices and especially dealing with like material on the ground and you know thinking about the real people who are mining this and I think that that's a huge gap and that I you know I really hope that through this indigenous AI projects that you know research and stuff that that, that gap can be bridged because you know as indigenous people in North America only a few handful of uh, computational materials are mined here and they're they're mined pretty ethically um, so that so this is um, it's it needs to be and through artworks and through future imagining and populating the future with um, ethical things <laughs> populating the future with like mythologies that are grounded um, in, in locations I think that that's I think that's the next horizon for for making ethical com computers and ethical decisions with our with our media so yeah I, that's why I'm very excited about about your guys's work and by and about the fact that this is all there's a reason like we're, we're both making these projects at the same time um, because I think that that's um, on the horizon yeah yeah I mean that's major to us that people are speaking to each other across silos of discipline but really specifically that they're they're having a variety of voices into these technologies. That's so exactly as you say. We have a real Darth for all the structural reasons, a Darth of voices from Black, Indigenous, people of color um, in, in technology and then, you know, storytelling more generally. So thank you for summing that up. Okay, great. So I'm going to um, move on to just talk a little bit about um, your experience at the lab. Um, and I'm just seeing here, um, checking our notes, two things. Um, and you can we can talk about them in whatever order. One, I want I know growing up for me being an artist was not a possibility. It just wasn't like a job you do. I told someone that I wanted to be an artist, and they were like, "Oh, that's something you do on the weekends. You have to have a real job." Um, and so that's that. I, and I didn't know anybody who had that job. That wasn't visible in my life um, or in you know the the class reality that I had growing up. So I'm really curious about what inspired you to become an artist and why, um, why specifically in this medium that you work in now? Yeah, I guess when I was younger, like I remember being in high school and having a friend tell me like, oh yeah, I I'm going to be an artist. And I was like, what a lofty goal. Like how, how can you be so sure that you're like, you're 16, right? Like how can you be so sure that you have good enough ideas to, to become, to say something that other people want to consume, right? And so for me, even that you know 10 12 years ago i didn't think it was possible it's really just been a process of following my passion or more clearly my passions and and seeing where they, they take me lots of my decisions throughout the years have taken me sort of away from this path that i saw as being towards being an artist or or, or a maker or whatever 
but in reality, those were the things that actually brought me much closer, allowed me to learn more things that I can take back to my practice and incorporate that, that was present with all, you know, going to school for music, but then leaving music school and deciding that I was going to build an airplane. And then through the process of, of the airplane, I learned, you know, a million things under that one little umbrella. So, uh, and then bringing those back to art and um, my work with Suzanne has influenced, you know, all of my decisions since then. So making installations and all this, um, but all those things are folding together. So it was never like, I, I'm going to be an artist. It was, it was a, a process of just doing what made me feel good and uh, finding out how I could make that the most effective and, and bring that to more people and help people to see the things that, that I'm thinking are super cool or that I'm seeing need to have some light shed on them. So um, it's a process. And I love that playful approach to technology. Um, it's, a, it, it's not that you learn technology and you're like, I'm done, I've learned technology. It's like this in, incredibly curious approach that all of you have where you just kind of keep pulling at different threads. Scientists are artists and artists are, are scientists, so. Yeah, I mean, I was very sure I wanted to be an artist. Um, and I first wanted to be a violinist. And my, my aunt um, is Alicia Spiegals, who's a very cl famous klezmer fiddler fiddlest. And uh, once I, I grew up knowing that she did that for her job. And that really, and I didn't know I wanted, I didn't know what kind of art I wanted to do. And I always thought I wasn't good enough at violin. But, you know, once I got into community college, and I spent, well, I spent four years at community college, like learning violin. And then um, once I realized that I didn't have to be trapped playing dead white men's music, I could make my own music, then like all bets were off. I was like, everyone's gonna wear costumes, it's gonna be conceptual. Um, because I, to me, be, being an artist is, is taking the skills that I know I have and not trying to, not trying to be something I'm not, like not trying to, um, become uh pick a, I couldn't pick a I'm not very good at listening to authority or I like I know my weaknesses so art seemed like the only way I could get to a place where I had any level of success um and and it also to me it's like if I'm going to do something um I have I have responsibilities to my family and my community and I knew this was the only thing I could do in life to like get myself and get like to a level where I could be um, responsible and contribute. So to me, art was like a do or die sort of thing, and it still is. Um, and that, it was, that was what was felt weird about going to art school and going to music school is I could feel a difference between people who were who were interested in art and like were going to school for it, and then people and then friends and people around me who knew that it was you know, this was the only way I could be, you know, you or, you know, somebody could be successful if, yeah, so it's a big opportunity and art really does open doors that you're not normally not allowed into. Um, and just so you can like squeeze in, you can like deep fake your way into spaces that you're not supposed to be in. And that's what, yeah, that's why I'm an artist. I mean, I think that's a really a beautiful notion. I mean, art, you know, is a mode of survival. It's how you've kind of function in the world. I mean, it's how you speak. It's how it's your language. You know, it's, it's something that you can quote unquote control, right? Um, and I think that's a that's a beautiful idea. And I think for me, you know, my sister she could draw. She was a, probably the most talented person in my entire family. But we never looked at it like art. We just looked at it as you know, my sister's just doing what she does. And I think you find that throughout you know different different black culture is like. You know, people are doing amazing things. You just don't quite see them as a, as an artist. And I think for a long time, I, I didn't even know what an artist does or what their role was. So I ended up going to architecture because I felt like that was the most concrete thing that I could do, um, but also operate on an art uh, on an art scale that's kind of above my own body, right? I can start to reimagine cities and places, environments, and landscapes. And so. Um, and then finally coming back to, to art in a more artful practice uh, through dance, through performance and music, really trying to embody all the languages that we speak. Um, it was really my goal and my intentions and still my intentions. Um, and really just to learn, like how do, how do we function in society and how we learn from it. It's kind of my goal.
Um, yeah, I think uh, I kind of, I still don't know what art is, right? I don't know what, what I'm doing <laughs> in a way, but that's what's enticing because I think what I've learned, um, I was always the drawer, the best, the, 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 the drawer of the class. I was the guy who you go to when you wanted anything pictorial and um, I set out that I wanted to be an artist and then I had to make a compromise with architecture um, because of course my family was not having me just be an artist just as you Ruthie it's just like no that's that's something you do in the weekends it's not a full-time thing and once I started doing architecture and asking certain questions I quickly began to know like I, I got into landscape architecture and I was like what would happen if two chains designed a landscape like that was my biggest concern and I quickly found out I wasn't a landscape architecture because I asked the wrong question and um, it was a process of figuring out what I wasn't and constantly stripping down what I wasn't and then I ended up here and this is is way more comfortable and I think the idea of not actually knowing what it is is actually what keeps me here um, exploring what it can it just endless possibility I think that's what art is for me it's just I can do different things and it could fall into different spaces and front new frontier lab where i'm talking to a bunch of people with common ideas that i never even thought was even out there before this so i think that's kind of what's interesting about being an artist to me is the fact that i i, I still don't know what it is because i probably don't know what i am i don't know what i'm about fully I'm, I'm figuring that out as well and i think art gives me an environment to do that and still contribute connect and be productive yeah, I mean, we're all figuring it out, right? We we had a, a little conversation about imposter syndrome, but that's that's capitalism again, doing that to us. Um, so thank you. Um, and that that kind of dovetails nicely into my next question, which is if you could talk a little bit about if uh, if there's something that you're going to take away from your lab experience uh, so far, or if there's something that surprised you about your lab experience so far. I know we're in the middle of it still, but we kind of had our concentrated piece. You've seen a couple piece, a couple things so far. I think the fact that we're all operating through Zoom, like um, that is very unique. I mean, I, I haven't done this many video calls in my entire life. So like operating and having these conversations with you all is, is something extremely new. And then and the fact that we're all able to kind of critique our own work and, um, and just have a communion essentially in a community through, through an online platform is, is really surprising actually. Uh, for me, the, the opportunity to get so many different perspectives from people who are so smart and brilliant and working on seriously important work has been just pretty incredible because every new person brings something completely different to the conversation that like I would have never thought of. Uh, and just having like an hour and a half in somebody else's shoes can be so valuable to contextualizing yourself and what you're doing and getting new resources to build upon that understanding. So. Um, yeah, the combination of the advisors and the fellows has just been like, incredibly useful and fun. Um, I think, I guess it's like how my first kind of opinion about the, the program, that it's like this inverted Manhattan project and the idea that when brilliant minds come together, something comes about. And it is kind of a, a it's just a, a natural phenomenon. And I think this program is really revealing that to me, like brushing myself up against brilliant minds, other like-minded minds, things evolve and things grow and things develop. And I think that's why when you're, you're it's, the, it's world war, what's the thing to do? You get brilliant minds together. And I think that as a strategy in during that time was used as a strategy for a reason because it is effective, be it for worse or for better, but it is effective. And I think New Frontiers Lab is trying to do it in a different way um, for better, of course. And it's just, I think it's awesome. It's awesome to see how an idea grows without even knowing how it's working. It's just happening. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that was said. I think that the, the thing about it being on Zoom is it's just, I know from doing residencies and going to grad school that like the place that you really make like the deepest um, connections is is the eating together and it's so sad that we can't all eat together every day so I think that that just makes me like I mean obviously really appreciate uh, human contact but um, I think that this is um, pretty amazing that it's able to happen even through all this and 
it's nice to have a touch point every week that uh, to kind of keep myself grounded, keep our project grounded and remind that every, everybody's in their places also trying to just get things done. And so it, it kind of, um, I think that it's, you know, I think thinking about these art things seem silly sometimes during this time and it and it can be really just I want you know some days I don't want to do art I just want to go out and protest uh, so but I think that there's a reason that we're do talking about the things that we're talking about and having the meetings that we're having and discussing during this time because um, after COVID after that we're these bigger issues are still going to be here so I think it's keeping me grounded to continue the conversation through it with good people. It wouldn't be fun at all if everyone was mean. And we get yeah, to I mean, look we... forward to the big party after when all of us can be together. Let's do it. <laughs> I was trying to think about, we're all in LA. Is there some like car caravan situation we could pull off? We could go to a drive-in or something. And just eat, eat together. <laughs> ah, Beata's rooftop. Um, yeah, I mean, you guys bring up some great points. Like we always think of it as of a convergence experiment and kind of uh, making this digital jump. Um, you guys have been a part of this incredible experiment and, and a real reason for a success. Um, I think we've also shown a way that we can be really flexible and generous with one another. And I hope that that's something that we kind of bring into our our lives going forward, how much our lives can kind of have some balance, although this has made some imbalance as well. But also the different ways, you know, Kite, I love that, the, you know, thinking about the different ways that we can participate and that you can't always be in the streets, although that is important to do and, and that has its moment. And sometimes you also have to be working on your practice and what is the, exactly what you guys have been talking about, what is the role of your, your work in your practice and, and how is that also creating change? Um, so thank you for the work that, that you all are doing and thank you for being a part of our community, for making our community um, together. <laughs>